My job is to think about the future. I provide advice, modelling and analysis to industry and government to help transition Australia to a low emissions future. And it's today wearing my modelling hat that I want to talk about something that I think is really important and something I think we probably all know but don't often talk about. And that is, no one can predict the future. Now this probably doesn't sound like a particularly smart thing to say for somebody who makes his living doing, doing modelling of the future. <laughs> Nevertheless, today I want to tell you why it is true, why modelling is still important, and then what you should do about it. Now on the face of it, this clearly seems false, right? No one can predict the future. Nonsense. People predict the future all the time. Obama will win the election, interest rates, Apple's latest product. There are poor forecasts everywhere. So maybe what I really mean is that no one can predict the future correctly. But that's also false, right? People correctly predict the future all the time. Unfortunately, they also incorrectly predict the future all the time. And if you don't know which forecast is right and which is wrong, what does that really mean about your predictions? Now, uh, for an example of this, I actually was a magician in a former life. Can I ask, can I ask you? Yes, white shirt. Yes, perfect. Can I ask you to think of a card for me? Your favourite card, A card, one card, whatever you want. Have you got one? All right, lock that in. I am going to make a prediction. I'm going to make a prediction here. All right, for the first time, what card were you thinking of? Ace of Hearts. Interesting. <laughs> Not that impressive, right? And yet, if I do this presentation another 51 times, give or take, sooner or later an audience is going to think that I am a god. Incorrectly, obviously. Unless they do their research, they won't realise that I picked a card purely by chance and got it right. Now, in this way, we can do all sorts of crazy things. Um, psychics, for example, they make their living by making so many predictions that eventually they get something right. And everyone hope, they hope forget everyone forgets about the 99% they got wrong. This is why scientifically psychics are known as um, frauds. <laughs> Funnily enough, financial analysts work exactly the same way. Study after study shows that hedge fund managers, investment fund managers do no better than chance. They're simply the people that happen to guess the ace of hearts right, the successful ones. And five years later they'll guess wrong and they're at the bottom of the pile instead. The Reserve Bank of Australia, who you would hope know what they're talking about, recently reviewed their financial forecasts and showed that they do no better than chance flipping a coin except for a couple of headline items, like interest rates, the thing that they control the most. No one can predict the future. Well, what about, what about other things, like society, technology? Do we do better there? I have a great example of this. Isaac Asimov, the famous science fiction author, uh, rec not recently, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, wrote an article in the New York Times about what 2014 would be like. His predictions were amazing. He predicted solar power in Arizona. We built the largest power station of its kind there last year. Self-driving cars, just like what Google is developing right now. Complete freezer meals. So, not a utopian future then. <laughs> Unfortunately, he also got a couple of things wrong. He predicted nuclear-powered toasters, moon colonies, and a society of enforced leisure, where the greatest thing available would be work. I wish. So, in fact, I went through his whole article and I colour-coded what he got right, wrong and eh. And you can see that for any single one of his predictions, it's really no better than 50-50 whether or not it would come true. Now, maybe that's better than the average person. I mean, there's a lot more wrong answers than right answers, right? You know, there's a lot more than one card in the deck. Um, but nevertheless, it means that any single prediction cannot be relied upon. So what I really mean is that no one can correctly and reliably forecast the 
future. Now, there are many reasons for this. Part of it is, of course, that there is a lack of selection bias in forecasts. Anyone can make a forecast, and in many ways, the wackier and crazier it is, the better. I mean, look at the recent uh, Malaysia air flight disappearance. The more far out and arrogant your theory was, the more likely it was to get news and blog time. And if you make a forecast far enough into the future, you can get all your speaking invitations done long before anyone knows if you were right or wrong. This is a really serious problem. Just like the card trick, if I don't show you my forecast in advance, you don't know whether I'm right or wrong, or whether it's just by chance. There's more serious problems, though. And some of this is, uh, this is you know, a, a big body of research here. Um, one of the big ones being the so-called black swan events by Nicholas Nassim Taleb. It was his book um, where he discovered this idea of events that would change the world but cannot be predicted, even though we might try to in hindsight. Rumsfeld later paraphrased this oh so eloquently as the unknown unknowns. Um, now, there's lots of examples of this, but if we go back to Asimov for a moment, we looked at what he got right and what he got wrong, but it's also worth looking at what he didn't get. For example, he didn't talk about the internet. How can you be a credible forecaster or foreteller if you didn't predict the internet, which has changed so much? His earlier works didn't predict transistors. His modern computers still ran on vacuum tubes. Multivac was his computer. And he didn't predict Justin Bieber having more Twitter followers than the president of the USA. So in this way, we do have to look at errors by omission as well. And those are the black swan events. But there is another distinct class of events that I think are just as important. And these are not the unknown unknowns, but the known unknowns. Things we know are coming, we just don't know when. Technology is rife with this sort of thing. How long does it take a prototype or an idea to become a technical and commercial reality? Now, as I said, my field is energy in Australia, and there are many examples of this here. For example, 15 years ago, there was virtually zero wind power in Australia. No one was forecasting wind. So who would have predicted that today we would have more than 3,000 megawatts of wind providing about 5% of our energy. And then, who five years ago would have believed anyone saying that we would now have more solar power than wind? Solar being previously the most expensive technology out there. Now, there's no shame here in analysts, thank goodness, uh, for not getting this, because if predicting the future is hard, predicting politicians is bloody impossible. And all of these things were driven by huge subsidies, or not huge, but generous subsidies from the government. And that completely changed the landscape. Where they did fall down, though, was that no one was predicting that as a result of something like this, these technologies would now be close to being the cheapest long-term source of energy for Australia. No one predicted that in 2050, the future was going to be wind and solar plus other things. Um, so this was a known unknown that just wasn't captured. So I think that's a great example of the past. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about energy in a moment. But of course, what's coming up ahead? Looking at the past is easy. So at the risk of forecasting the future in a talk about not forecasting the future, I want to talk about a couple of things which I think are really important known unknowns. Now, there's lots of examples of this. Bill Gates was recently talking about the automation of jobs. Um, computers or robots taking over jobs previously done by humans. I mean, take driverless cars. Does anyone seriously believe that in five to 50 years, cars, or at least taxis, won't be driven by computers? Uh, what about um, books? Does anyone really believe that paper book sales are going to increase over the next 10 years? I think it's the other way. Education. Uh, does anyone really believe that the future of tertiary education, maybe even secondary, won't rely heaven, heavily on the massive open online courses? I think this is a huge part, and it's going to have a huge implication for our education and funding models. And so it's really encouraging to see that UQ is right out there in preparing these courses. Um, if only Kodak had realized that the camera world would change with digital cameras and had started investing in that instead of doubling down on film and going bankrupt. And then, of course, there's all of the different technologies. Um, one that I think is a really exciting is 3D printing. This is the idea that you can design something on your computer 
and then print it out in your office or living room and have it in your hands an hour later. Now, these have been developing for a while, but recently they have expanded. You can now print anything from cars to body parts. They replaced a woman's skull with a 3D printed skull to electronics. And that works the other way too, through crowdfunding and Kickstarter. It is now possible to buy one of these machines, not for thousands of dollars, but for hundreds of dollars, and have it in your home. These new machines can print out plastic, metal, glass, ceramic. In the future, maybe the future of manufacturing is not going to be buying uh, off eBay from China. It's going to be downloading your design and printing it yourself. And that has big implications for the sector, whether onshore or offshore. What about scanning yourself with your Kinect sensor and then 3D printing your clothes? Maybe the future of piracy is you really can download a Ferrari. There are many possibilities here. I, 3D printing is going to change the world. I just don't know how or when, um, because no one can predict the future. And if we go back to energy for a moment, the future, uh, well, I guess one obvious future is, does anyone really believe that we are not moving to a low emissions world? I mean, this is one prediction I'm happy to make, because if I'm wrong, we're all going to have bigger problems than coming back to me for an I told you so. Low emissions is coming. The question is how? And there are kind of two futures. At the moment, we're looking at a future of big power stations, formerly coal, now wind and solar. Rooftop solar is obviously a big part of that, but it can't be the whole story because it doesn't operate overnight or during, the day, or during cloudy days. That all changes if battery storage becomes cheap. If that happens, then suddenly houses can effectively self-supply all their energy, and these big investments that we've got going suddenly become useless. And this has huge implications, both for current investments and for planning, but also for questions of equity. What about people who can't put solar on their roofs? They live in apartments or in a, or in a very rainy area. Um, there are huge issues there. If they have to pay for the whole power system themselves, that becomes very expensive. Now, this is something that people are starting to think about, but there's still a feeling that despite all the pressures on battery storage from mobile phones, electric cars, that cheap enough storage is still 20 years away. And that might be right. But five years ago, there was no solar power in Australia. So the question then is if there are all these known and known unknowns, what should you do about it? The answer is not to say we're not going to do any modeling, because there is value in thinking about the future. By thinking and planning, you can understand possible futures if you're open-minded enough. You can identify risks and opportunities that you weren't previously aware of. Good modeling can help you understand what is important in the system and what is unimportant. And I think this is the most important thing you learn as a physicist. You learn how to study a whole system and decide which bits matter and which bits are just kind of the noise around the edges. And if you've got no idea what these are, it's probably not worth worrying about these just yet. That is the value of modeling, as well as being able to analyze history, understand what just happened, quantify things, put numbers on them rather than just talking. And there is value here. The problem with modeling only comes when you seek certainty rather than try to understand uncertainty. The right way is to model many scenarios to understand risks and benefits. Yes, you have to plan for something. You've got to make a best guess. And most governments and businesses do understand this. But you also have to consider the risks and the scenarios. Design your investments and your policies to be robust against a broad range of futures. If you only seek certainty, then this happens. Followed very closely by this the lawsuits. If you assume that a forecast of traffic is going to be right, particularly 20 years into the future, let alone 12 months, then you're in for some rude shocks. And this to me, it comes to my most important point, what I actually really came here to say today. And this is not so much to the consumers of forecasts, although I hope you've taken that stuff away. It's to people who produce them. Whether this is in a report with modeling, or in a press release about your latest research, we need to take more responsibility for our forecasts. We need to not provide certainty. 
because that's what people want to pay for, right? They want to pay to remove doubt, to know what to do. And I'm as guilty of this as the next guy in terms of, you know, giving people certainty um, because that's what they really want. But we have to be better than that. We have to help people understand that we can't predict certainty, that we can't give them what they want. What we can do is help them understand a diverse future to really think about the limits of where we could go. And of course, there's problems here because uh, Arthur C. Clarke pointed this out. Any forecast of the future that is easily believable is probably going to be wrong. And any forecast crazy enough to keep up with how quickly things change is not going to be believed. But that shouldn't be our cop-out. We should try to make sure that people really understand that things are not just going to be the old world going again. We need to take the new world and we need to use the old ideas to understand it, but do more than that. We need to predict how things will change and how things will grow. And that is my, my, uh, my summons today to everybody who can do modeling and who does this, to think about the future and to give people as much information as they can so that they then make a decision. Because delaying a decision is a decision in and of itself. It's a conscious action to not decide. And it may be right or it may be wrong. We need to help them decide and make the best decision possible. And even if that is the wrong decision, as it turns out, if that was the best decision at the time, it is still the right decision. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot predict the future, but that doesn't mean we can't plan for it. Thank you.